and welcome everyone to our panel discussion of today. Today we're gonna have Deutsche Telekom, RDK, Whiteplay and Broadpeak joining us to discuss about TV moving to all IP, dream or reality. My name is Andy Waldenspiel and my consultancy is working with thought leaders, game changers and innovators of the media and telco industry. Today, I'm excited to be moderating this panel with fantastic guests. So let's look at who do we have as our speakers. So we have Pedro Bandera. Hola, Pedro. Hello, Andy. Very nice to meet you here and the rest of the, of the guests. So quick introduction on my side. So I'm Pedro. I'm VP in Deutsche Telekom Europe, responsible for product, mainly taking care of TV and broadband and where are we taking this very, very important part of our TV and broadband ecosystem into the future. Thank you, Pedro. And we got Rob Suero from RDK. Thank you for hosting us, Andy. I'm Rob Suero, Head of Technology with RDK. We're driving the community roadmap and um, community collaboration. So when we end up with a new feature or a new technology, it's not just a part of RDK, but it works for the entire community. It's a common solution for the entire community. Thank you, Rob. And we got Dominique Ferral from Whiteplay. Hello, hello, Andy. Hello, everyone. I'm Dominique Ferral. I'm Chief Sales and Marketing Officer and Co-Founder of Whiteplay. So at Whiteplay, we help TV operators to uh, provide a solution which resonates with uh, end user experience. Um, as an example, we, we solve the goal shouted 10 seconds in advance in the apartment next door or, or the goal notification that you will get on Twitter in advance. You can call it system integrator, a TV expert. This is uh, what we do with uh, tier one companies such as Canal, Telefonica, DirecTV for more than a decade. Thank you, Dominique. And last but not least, Xavier Leclerc from Broadpeak. Hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Xavier. I run business development here at uh, Broadpeak. Broadpeak is a provider of video solutions, a solution you can use to store and deliver a video onto various IP networks. And I look after strategic relationships with partners and customers. Great. Thank you all. Fantastic to have you here in this panel talking about TV moving to all IP, dream or reality. Let's start maybe with Pedro. I mean, dream, it was in the past. I think it's becoming reality for you to move to all IP. Maybe tell us a bit about Deutsche Telekom's journey for Europe, which is your realm. Where are you? Where are you going? And what are some of the key challenges you're facing? So the dream is becoming a reality. I think that's the, that's the first message. So it's already a reality in some, in some of our countries. Uh, we actually started on this journey about two years ago, and we, we expect by the end of 2022 to have our complete footprint running um, on, on full IP. And when I'm talking about full IP, I'm talking about unicast. I'm not talking about multicast because multicast is also IP. So it's also part of the, of the IP protocol. Now, uh, let's try to understand why. Because the why, I think it's important. Um, yeah. Why do we want to move to unicast? Because it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because if you go with unicast, you have more bandwidth. So why would an operator actually want to have more bandwidth or use more bandwidth to deliver the same services? So actually, the answer is that we don't want more bandwidth, but there is a trade-off. And the trade-off is by going to Unicast, you are basically aligning with web technologies. That's where all the innovation and the fast track and the creativity is happening. Now, if, if, I, if I'm able to disconnect from legacy technologies, like for instance, multicast or, or DVB broadcasting, it becomes much easier for me to evolve at a faster pace and with higher quality, my product. So the reason why we do it is because we want to deliver the best products to our customers and we want to be fast to in innovate in the market. That of course has a price, right? And the price that you pay is more utilization in terms of bandwidth in your networks. But if you think about it, and if you think about the growth of broadband in the, in the last five, seven years, actually that growth is already happening. So, so the question that we as operators need to, need to answer is, 
can we somehow fit this into the growth of our network that is being supported by the broadband by the broadband usage and, and i think depending on the network and depending on the specific country the answer might be yes already or no later on but there is no denying that the vision is there and the clear path is there we'll get there we'll get there at different speeds in different com- uh, countries but no one doubts that that's where we are taking our, our approach to video delivery. Okay, maybe worthwhile to also take one step back and say we are all moving to IP. Let's remind ourselves, why are we doing this in the first place? What are the, the benefits or the expected benefits by moving to all IP? So why are we doing this in the first place? So I, I, I somehow got into that in my, in, my, in, my, in my previous answer. So the reason for me, as working on the telecommunication space, knowing that I need to deliver applications and services that are running both on set of boxes as well as open devices, is that I need to cut my connections with legacy connection uh, with legacy technologies that are heavy on integration, because those legacy technologies that are heavy on integration are slowing me down in terms of cost, but also in terms of speed to innovate and, 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 and the overall resilience of, of, of my solution in terms of the product that I deliver to, 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 to my customers. Just to give you an example, for instance, the actual support of multicasting a set of box is something that is, that, that is done mostly on, on the SOC level. So we need specific support from, from the SOC vendor. So, and, and that creates complexity, that creates uh, delays, that creates also additional work in terms of integration, not only when you do it once, but also further down the road because you need to maintain it, you, you need to, to, to manage the life cycle of, of that solution. I don't want that. I want to be on even ground with the web providers because the web providers are moving at a high speed in terms of, of innovation and I need to match that. And I cannot match that if I'm overweight, overweighted. And I will be overweighted if I needed to carry those, those legacy solutions. Of course, as I mentioned, there are no free lunches. So by yeah. doing that, I'm putting extra load on my network. Yes, we understand it, but also like I mentioned, we need to fit that in into the growth of broadband that we feel on the majority of the countries in which the evolution to fiber is happening very, very quickly. That should be something that should be we should be in a position to manage. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Xavier, you're working with tier one operators around the globe, whether it's cable, fiber, whatever delivery mechanism, and some of them even have a lot of bandwidth have moved to multicast. Why is that? What's in for them? And uh, what's their thinking? Yep. So uh, just to um, bounce myself, right? I think um, multicast uh, is an interesting technology, right? And when you look at why some of the largest operators are moving to multicast, there is the idea of scalability, right? So uh, being able to have um, streams going through the network that will not overwhelm uh, the network, will not create choke points. So here with multicast technology, you can basically scale your live delivery in a very elegant way, right? So that's the first aspect. But the real driver when we talk to customers and if you look at uh, the number of the multicast uh, deployments we have, we're talking about multicast ABR here, um, the vast majority of them are on fiber networks, right? Which is interesting. You have a lot of bandwidth on fiber networks, and this is where we see demand. And the way maybe to explain that is that typically when operators are building new infrastructure, so it may be, um, you know, I'm thinking about a cable provider, for example, in Mexico, building out new um, footprints on uh, fiber, they basically look, look at the technology at what's available, and they found that multicast ABR is an interesting um, combination of technology, because it gives you basically the scalability of multicast, but also the versatility of ABR, and this is what Pedro was alluding to, right? You want your content to be on ABR so you can move as fast as the web uh, players, but if you can scale it with multicast, that's an interesting combination, right? So it's both being able to do the scalability and the quality, um, knowing that when you use multicast, you guarantee delivery, right? Multicast takes precedence over uh, unicast, so you're less likely to run into rebuffering, you're less likely to have drops in quality. You typically have a better experience when you deliver with multicast. So, Pedro, can we agree that maybe in the short or midterm, multicast may be a solution uh, to a problem that you can fix later? 
let's let's talk specifically about multicast ABR because yeah. the, I think this is the difference because multicast ABR does the connection with my need and my need is that I need to move at the speed that those web providers are moving. So by doing multicast ABR termination in the gateway, I'm actually abstracting my TV devices from the actual complexity of the implementation of, of multicast. So that's great. That's wonderful. That, that, that is a good thing. I think multicast ABR, I look at it very much as a transition technology in the sense that it's a tool, it's a very effective tool that I can use and I will use in some markets to bridge the gap between what I have today and what I need to have in the future in terms of network capacity. But we also need to understand that multicast ABR is also not a free lunch in the sense that I need to have the support for multicast ABR in the gateways. I also need to have, let's call it the hardware specs that are needed on the gateway to support multicast ABR. And I need to have also on the gateway, the, the software to support uh, to support multicast ABR. And it creates an additional point, point of favor. So um, I, I'm, I'm personally a fan of the approach as a transition mechanism, but I'm also a believer that as more and more bandwidth becomes available, this will be less of a need, so you will not need to do it. So it will phase out over time as you have more than enough bandwidth in your networks. So let's see, Pedro, in three to five years, whether you were right with that prediction that I may doubt that they, we ever will have enough bandwidth because there will always something to fill the pipes, regardless of how big they are, because you don't want empty pipes in your network in the end. No, can I answer that question or is it just a statement? And <laughs> <laughs> please answer. <laughs> I, 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 th I think everything that goes up eventually comes down, right? As you add more and more bandwidth, it actually, we are getting to a point in which we don't need the bandwidth. And listen, if you think about it, what today is driving the growth in bandwidth, it's not applications, it's more devices in the household. You have more and more devices in the household that by themselves in the background are always doing stuff like uh, or operating system uh, updates, app updates, and, 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 st and stuff like that. So as we all have more uh, uh, devices in the home, yes, bandwidth is, is, is going up. Yes, we'll have a second wave of more devices in the home, like the fridge is connected with, to the internet, the microwave oven, everything. But it will only get you that far. I'm not seeing the next big thing in terms of applications. If you don't think about very fancy things like augmented, augmented reality scenarios that are still realistically many, many many years in the, in, the, in the future. I don't see what is the application that in five years, it's not 4K, it's not 4K for sure, because 4K, if I'm giving yeah. as a standard product to, to, my, to my customers a one gigabit per second connection, it's not 4K at 16 megabits per second or 25 or even 30 megabits per second, that will make a difference. Yeah, I agree. So let's see, let's stay tuned. There's more to come for sure. Rob. From your side, uh, how does RDK get involved in that? You're on RDKB, you're on RDKV. Where do you see things like multicast ABR happening? And do you have a preference where it should happen? I don't have a preference. It's a journey, and, you know, like you said. And I, I think the majority of operators are looking at landing at all unicast at some point in the future. But, but as you mentioned, it's RDK video and, and broadband. And, and so in the scenario where you have the residential gateway, hosting the, the multicast or terminating the multicast and providing a uh, unicast stream to, to a video device, RDK is on both sides of that. So you have a, a whole home solution for multicast that takes care of the video side and takes care of the broadband side. So from, from a um, operator perspective, it's nice to have one profile and, and one software stack to work with that addresses both sides of that. Okay. Good. So network efficiency and available bandwidth is one thing in the equation, but uh, we all hear that uh, the neighbor already shouts gold. Dominic, you were referring to that. While you still don't even see that the penalty will happen. Um, so we're talking about latency between the devices. We're talking about fast channel change. Uh, what are the things you have experienced in your work with tier one operators, Dominic? I can tell you one anecdote. We, we are working with a TV operator 
um, who is deployed over multiple countries. In one of them, it was pure unicast, and it was working perfectly for non-linear, linear TV, over set-top box, mobile devices. And one day, this TV operator acquired football rights. And during the first match, it has been a disaster because unicast was not uh, sufficient to support uh, the, the, the peak. So they had to introduce really quickly the IPTV to manage it. So coming back to the first point, yes, we are in transition phase to uh, full IP, but the full unicast is not for today, neither tomorrow. So let's see. Okay. And in this uh, transition and coming back on what Rob said uh, regarding the, is it the CPE or the set top box? Uh, I will say that like uh, like Rob, we don't care. We we have the technical competencies on RDKV or RDKB to integrate uh, the, the, the components. So the multicast ABR, we did the broad peak integration. Uh, but there is something that we see uh, each time that we do a deployment, uh, which is the player and not the player itself, but the player in, in the whole ecosystem. So the uh, the integration of the player, the capability to manage the parental control coming from the back end, to find the best route to the CDN, uh, to uh, define the right bit rate when you start streaming, uh, the latency to acquire the, the, the DRM from the, the, the server. So at the end, we have to fine tune uh, everything to have uh, the best uh, user experience not only at the player, but in the whole chain, uh, including the CP, but as well the, the backend. Okay. So talking about CP, we don't have a CP vendor here. Maybe I just take my old set the box vendor hat from, from Samsung. Um, what are the challenges for them? Or maybe uh, back to you, Pedro, you work with several CPE vendors. Um, having that solution, whether it's an RDK or different uh, video stacks, um, what are the challenges you're facing working with multiple because you're not doing single source? So what can you tell us about that? So, so it, it has always been a challenge, as you know, in our industry. So typically while working with different OEMs, you had different, different stacks. And I think that's, that's the problem that we all as an industry are trying to solve with initiatives like RDK. So RDK is one initiative, both on the broadband side as well as, as on the TV side that is actually addressing that problem. So how do we ab abstract what we are doing from, from the OEM so that we have a common stack that can run on, on multiple OEMs? So we are also on that path. So both on the broadband side as well as on the TV side, we are going with common uh, operating systems that will protect us from those type of problems in the in the future. And I think for the for the industry as a whole, that's the only way forward. Because if you are connected to the OEM, you are too much connected to the OEM in the sense that you are connected in terms of cost, you are connected in terms of your speed to to innovate in terms of services and capabilities that are built. On, on, on top of that CPM, but you are also connected with your speed also to correct problems. And more and more, we want to be on the driving wheel, uh, driving the car. We, we don't want to have a partner that we don't know if they will be around in two years time or if we will be a priority for them in two years time to, to, to do that. So for us as an operator, control of our touch points, the devices that we have in the customer home is of the utmost importance for us in the future because it's on that software that I'll be able to create on top of the enablers. And RDK is just an enabler, it's not a differentiator. So it's something that we need to have and I think we all as an industry need to have, but by itself, it's not a differentiator. It's all about what you as an operator built on top of that. Rob. I'm sure you have things to add on that. Uh, uh, I always thought it was a differentiator. It was the greatest thing. It's just an enabler now. No, I, I, I agree with, with Pedro on that. The, the, um, the key benefit, which he just, with Pedro just mentioned, is that you develop once on RDK and it's portable across all your OEM devices. So you're not working with each OEM trying to add a feature to a roadmap. You can lean in, you can manage your own roadmap and contribute the, um, the features that you need and the modifications that you need into RDK. So it really gives you that level of, of um, it lets you innovate at that level and, and lets you do what you need to do on your own. You can lean in and, do, and take care of all of that. 
Okay. And can I can I just comment one thing, Rob? Because we are saying exactly the same thing. It's it's an enabler if we both have it. It's a differentiator if I have it and you don't have it. Okay. Yes. So my statement it's for me and the rest of the community for everyone that has it. It's just an enabler. Then we compete on what we build on top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and if I may, Andy, you know, this is, this is, I think, really, really interesting, right? Because this is where basically the innovation is left to the specialist, right? So we're, we are Broad Peak, we do a lot of video, but we're not the only application that can run on the gateway or set-top box. We see more and more um, applications like, you know, managing the Wi-Fi, you're managing security. And I like this idea of basically opening the CP and being able to say, right, this is a new place for you to run your software load, um, a, bit, a bit like an application store, right? Like an app store, you can come in with third party application. Like Pedro said, you know, you're not tied to uh, your vendor's pace of innovation. You can have specialists basically coming in and then delivering the innovation you need to differentiate yourself. So I think that's an interesting evolution of RDK, right? Being able to offer this app store. Yeah. But still, it isn't like that you take RDK out of the box and it will work for all your use cases. You need to still do some tweaking. And Dominique, you were talking about some of them, adjusting it to the player, doing the fine tuning in that. Um, so tell us a bit about that. Yeah, the, the, the point which is funny is that we are all evolving um, in an ecosystem where everything is open and it's free and it's true. And RDK is really the, the, the perfect example uh, to, and it's really attractive because uh, it gives the opportunity to everyone uh, to develop themselves their product. However, it's not so, I would say, easy. And um, we have been uh, called by a TV operator to help them. They design themselves uh, an OTT uh, set of box. And when we arrived, the, the zapping time was at nine seconds. So it's uh, totally uh, incredible and unacceptable. Uh, so we helped them to, to fine tune and we went down to three, four seconds. So I would say that if there was just one sentence to, to remember, uh, I would say that uh, open and free does not mean easy. And basically that's where we play. Okay. And uh, Rob, you work also with several system integrators, I assume, right? So that you give to whoever wants to implement RDK on the B or V side. Uh, so you have a program for that, is that? We, we, we do we, we do have a, a support program for that, a um, preferred program. And, and um, a big part of that is, is, is getting integrators, getting Dominique um, to to um, be able to go into the RDK software and, and know exactly where he can cut six seconds off of a tune time and, and support him in that way. That, that's huge. And, and just as important would be if he would contribute those six seconds back to the general code base so we could all benefit from that. But <laughs> I, I understand everybody wants to, to differentiate themselves as well. Yeah. But, but um, we, we do have a, a a very robust community um, of, I think, over 430 now uh, members with a large number of that being system integrators. Dominique's one of our favorites, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but Rob, maybe let's stay with you for a second. Sure. So if you have a, an operator that says, okay, I'm considering RDK either on B or on V, what are the recommendations other than yes, go with us? What are the recommendations you give him to say, let's make it with the all IP uh, target in mind? What are the recommendations you give him? How to do it, how to get there most efficiently and fastest? Well, if, it, if it's an operator starting with RDK, I, I would suggest that they, they not put everything on their entire roadmap as an operator into this first deployment. You, you know, do the, the crawl, walk, run phase and, and get, a, get a device running, get your application running in your user interface, and then expand out from there to other elements of the roadmap. But like I mentioned, we're a really big community. So the most important advice would be don't do it alone. Work with somebody who's done this before, reach out to one of our system integrators and, and let someone help you along on the journey. And, and the, the other um, advice I would give is most people in your organization probably have a day job already. So, so look to bring some, some UIs onto this and, and dedicate them to this. Don't just add this to their task list. 
good point about mindset and organization. Uh, Pedro, since you're in the middle of it, uh, from your experience, what is the golden way to organize such a big transition from broadcast to all IP? Can you just keep the same guys in the same position, just do something different? Or how does it work? It's, it's a tough question. And, uh, and I think it applies also to a lot of other areas in which on the telco side, we are going through transformation. So we should always respect the people that we have in the company and that are working, let's call it, on legacy things and try to give them uh, an opportunity to, to evolve and to, to acquire skills that will be enable them to work in, in, in other areas. And this, this is one example. So getting someone that was, for instance, a broadcast expert and transform him into a, let's call it a streaming expert. Is it simple? No, it's very complicated. And uh, I think, you know, some of the skill sets that you need when you do the transition to IP, you don't have in the legacy profiles that were working on the, on the broadcast side. So that all the experience around IP, routing, uh, security applications, that's all missing. Is it impossible? No, but I, I think my experience tells me that the percentage of people that you actually get to, to transition is, is much smaller than what you'd hope. So I think it's 20%, um, uh, something like that. So it means that we need to fill. We need to get people that are coming from other areas, uh, even other areas in the company or other areas outside the company, to, to come in and join and help us on this transformation path to, to, to OIP. Um, like, like in all transformations, it, it takes a toll. In this case, a human toll. This is not only happening in this transformation. This is happening all across the different areas on the telco side as we go on this journey to become full digital um, operators. Um, and it's something that we need to be very careful because everything that has a human impact, we need to have a lot of respect and try to do it in the best possible way for, for everyone. So we try as much as possible to find future opportunities for, for, for everyone. We try to invest in, in qualification. We try to move them to new things. At times it's possible, at times it is not possible. Okay. So what do you think uh, the larger challenges don't lie in technology, they rather lie in organization and mindset transformation? There are big challenges on mindset, right? If you have been doing the same thing for 20 years, it's difficult to change your mindset. And it's, it's, it's very much depending on individuals, right? There are individuals that will embrace change because just, just because it's part of their DNA, but there are uh, other individuals that will have a very, very hard time embracing change especially, and it gets pro proportional to the amount of time in which we have been doing the, the same thing. So as we all grow old, it gets difficult for us to, to adapt to, to, to new things. Uh, so I think that's a big thing. Uh, and it impacts not only the execution, but even before the execution, the vision. So you embracing that the future is that thing. The fact that uh, to, for us to be successful on the execution, we need to believe the vision, right? So it's also my job and the, and, the, and the rest of the management team to spread the vision and to have everyone welcome and embrace the vision that that's the right path because this, this, and this. So you become almost coaches in which you need everyone to, to believe in the vision uh, because we will need those elements to be part of the, of the execution. So that plays a huge role in our ability to, to execute. And um, is, is it something that we as a telecommunication industry have fully solved it? No, because contrary to the internet industry in which it's being born in front of our eyes, right? So you start without any legacy, we have legacy. It has good things that legacy, but it also has at times some things that are less good. Rob, talking about legacy, um, you are catering for cable, fiber customers. You just bought one of the largest satellite providers a few weeks, yeah. months back eh, with Sky. I, I wish we had the budget in RDK to buy a satellite operator. Not RDK, but uh, come <laughs> Yeah. 
I, I, I was going to say, you mentioned uh, the the, the uh, preferred program, and and we do have a lot of material in there. We we have um, a lot of documentation. We have webinars in there. We have a, a series of training materials, and we can do on-site training if necessary. So we can help. Uh, I, I'd hate to use the word legacy. We can help your your employees come up to speed on RDK and, and be contributors with RDK. So there, there's a lot of material and a lot of things that we can do to help you along on that journey. Okay. And uh, talking about all IP and focus, because you're catering for these very different uh, needs of um, broadcast versus IP, um, do you have separate tracks for all IP players versus the satellite players, or is just so modular that it's easy, you, you take it off the shelf and just compile it? Yeah, you, you do, and it is componentized, so you are able to take the, the parts that you need. If, you, if you're working with a, a QAM device, you need more components than you would with an all IP device, but you do pull those together. It's, it's based on Yocto, and you use that to pull in the elements that you need for your build, so very much so. Okay. Xavier, on your side, um, do you have a lot of legacy from the old broadcast world or are you one of these born in front of Pedro's eyes that are all IP native right from the start? Yeah, that's a good question, Andy. So, you know, when you look at what the industry has been doing for the last 15 years, delivering content over IP, right? What is interesting is we've done IP for, for a long time, right? And Broadpeak is, um, was 10 years last year, actually. And what we used to do was IPTV, right? So we mentioned it at the beginning, sort of uh, multicast to one screen, right? To the set-top box. And what is interesting is today, you still have a large number of streams, a large number of customers still connected and consuming IPTV, right? So if you look across Europe, I think the numbers are about 50 uh, millions of uh, set of users still using a set of boxes and delivery of video over IP using traditional IPTV. So, you know, we're not necessarily uh, part of the old game. We're probably more part of the new game, but we see a lot of opportunities here to transition from what used to be basically the legacy IPTV to the new models, right? Being able to deliver content to any device, uh, delivering the right quality of experience, reducing latency, reducing zap time. I think there's a lot to do here um, in this world. Right, so it's not just a new deployment, but we also have to think about you know the, the legacy setups and how we can transition them. Thank you, Xavier, for that. Uh, Dominic, uh, you have partners all over the planet. Um, some are moving IP, some are a bit slower. What do you hear in the discussion with them? Why are they not embracing? all the fantastic benefits Pedro has told us about, what's holding them back? Basically, uh, the, the, the maturity of the countries uh, is not the same when you compare Germany and, and, and South America. So clearly the dynamic is different. And, uh, and for some countries, the satellite for the time being uh, stay the, the best solution to deliver uh, live TV. Uh, having the unicast for all the non-linear consumption. So I would say that legacy is our day-to-day -day life. So we have to work with really uh, all solutions which have been deployed and try to extend the life duration uh, of these uh, set of boxes. What's funny is that um, we are often in touch with uh, all the old boxes with uh, basic IP connectivity without uh, DASH support or HLS or any, I would say, adaptive uh, streaming mechanism. So we have to uh, add uh, this uh, capability uh, on top of the set box. And uh, for this type of operator, moving from one old proprietary operating system to the, to the new one, to, to RDK as an example, uh, one point which is interesting is that at Yplay, we are coming from Linux, uh, so it, it has been a normal evolution to, to, to move to RDK. Uh, I will say quite easy to train internally uh, all our software developers to be uh, uh, really professional on, uh, as well on the video and, and on, the, on the gateway. So uh, I will say that the transition for any um, legacy operator to move to these new technologies is, is quite easy. Okay. So, let, so legacy will go away in one point. Um, the question is, how long will it take? And let's maybe talk about Central Europe or Western Europe. 
Um, what is your bet? How many years will it take until we are there in all IP? Pedro, you mentioned 2022. That is fast. Uh, do you think that's for the majority of the operators? This is introduction, right? This is the point ah, in which okay. you start. It's not the point in which you finish, right? Well, what you need to understand is that we, we should not drive this as investment, right? So it's a technology uh, transition. Uh, we don't drive migrations for the sake of, the, of technology. So what will happen over the coming years is that customers will evolve, let's call it, to these new offers through commercial upsell. So in a natural way, you evolve to this product because it's a new, better product than the legacy product that you had. I'm not actively trying to migrate without any incremental benefit to me as an operator, these customers. Of course, we will reach a point in which we have so few customers left in the, in the old technologies that we need to find a way to migrate them and shut it down. Is it happening, happening anytime soon? No. Uh, so I think, I think that the front read, even for, for the front reading customers, it will take them at least five years to, to be in a position to do something like that. So I think it will still take a very long time for, for the old products, for the old technologies to, to disappear completely. So just for clarity, when I mentioned 2022, that's to start the process because you want right. a new product, you want a new service. And then you need to migrate your customers commercially because that's the best way for us as operators to, to preserve value. You need to migrate those customers over time. Absolutely. Yeah. And okay. maybe just to bounce on that, if I can, Andy. Yes, yeah, I think it's also the ecosystem that's maturing, right? Pedro is describing how we start and how we get there maybe in five years. I think we also need to look at initiatives like RDK, making it easier to basically innovate, but also the broader ecosystem, right? I'm thinking, you know, standardization of technologies, you know, more ABR everywhere, things like, you know, DVB IP native um, standardization. So you can put ABR on any networks, whether it's satellite, GTT or, or others. So I think it's very much the, you know, giving momentum to the transition and we still at the beginning right now, I think. Okay, good point. Um, Rob, on the US, do you see similar timelines or are they further ahead, farther behind? What do you I, think? I, I would say I see similar timelines, but, but legacy always lasts longer than you think it will. It, it always, <laughs> and, and then at, at some point, the new stuff becomes legacy as well. And, and that's, again, another area where we think we differentiate ourselves is is we don't end up life legacy devices or support for those. We work with, with our partners to support legacy devices as long as they want to run them in, in their networks. So we're, we're, that's one of the things we really try to do is, is enable these operators to run legacy forever if, if that's what they want to, or even if they want to sell them somewhere else and support them in, an, in another operator. So that's an area we think is, is really important to support. Great. Great. Partners, partners, partners. Dominique, you want to yeah. add to that? Yeah, something fun uh, based on what you said, Rob. When we created Wayplay, it was back in uh, 2006, mm -hmm. and we were in the process of raising money, and we met a lot of investors, and some of them said, guys, what are you doing with the set-top box? The set-top box is dead. Mm -hmm. In uh, two years or three years from now, we will have only connected TV. So yes, there is a trend. We see a lot of connected TV, but we see always the future being just in front of us, and the future every year is moving Far away, so it will arrive. But today, for a TV operator to manage the way they distribute the content, they need to manage at least the application. And if they cannot have the same application across all the devices, they need a box to support this application. And um, so, it's not for tomorrow. Okay, so not for tomorrow, but since you are all quite experienced in the journey, maybe tell our audience and let's go around the table. Let's use the last couple of five minutes of what is the things, the recommendations, the tips, the hints, the pitfalls you want to point out for others who want to follow you in the journey. Let's start with uh, Pedro. What are your uh, journey you can share and want to share? It's, it's, it's a very open question. I think first you need to get your vision right. You need to, to understand where are you taking your, your TV product and why. 
So are things like super aggregation relevant to you? Uh, what is your strategy in terms of supporting your product across different devices, even open devices? So I think some of those answers are obvious to us. They might not be obvious to, 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 to other operators or for, for less, less advanced markets. Now, if you start on the path, it's really a transformation path. So it starts from within. It starts within the company. So the team setup is extremely important. You need to have the right team to achieve, uh, to achieve the results. So it means that at times you need to, have, to seek outside the company for experts that can help you um, on this journey. Uh, but like everything in life, the good balance is a good mix, right? So it's also very important to get the right partners for what is not business critical or business differentiator. So companies like Broadpeak and then Yplay, and forgive me if I say so, but for me, the streaming part of it, it's not a business differentiator. Is something that I need to have. It needs to work very well, very resilient, it needs to support all the way to standard, but all the operators will be on even plane. So all the operators will tentatively have uh, exactly the same, the same technology solutions, but you need to have it. So it means that you need to partner with the right companies that will give you the solutions that you need, for instance, on the streaming side, in terms of a good CDN solution, a good origin solution, integration with DRM. And those for me, as an operator, those are not the differentiators that I want to focus the internal teams. I focus the internal teams on the engagement with the customer, uh, so on the application level, and I partner with companies that can give me the best possible, let's call it, core items that are not business differentiators, but are enablers that I need to have by default. And um, RDK is somehow different because it's not a, a company. It's not something that we are actually buying as a service. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's an open source platform, but it's something that is also very important as an enabler for you to build on top of that, those, those business differentiators. So get your story right in terms of getting the right ecosystem, both inside the company as well as on the outside the company and start on that journey. Thank you, Pedro. Rob, what are your key messages you want to pass? I think I'll, I'll just build on what, what Pedro was saying. Um, don't let the technology run you. Define the product that you need to build for your customers to stay competitive and use the technology to, to get there. Don't let the technology drive you. But RDK is a great technology. Of, of course it is. And, and you, could, you would use RDK to, to, to do that journey. But, but don't look at, at what RDK is and think, oh, this is what I'm limited to. RDK is an open source platform. So if you wanted to extend RDK to do some new features that would really differentiate you, you should do that. And, and don't look at it as, oh, this is all I have to pick from. Look at it as your starting point. And, and build the product you want with RDK. And we're, we're there to help you if you want to extend it beyond what it does today. Cool, thank you. Xavier, from your side. Yeah, so we're talking a lot about the customer and the needs. I think it's always good to start with uh, the end customer. So maybe uh, two, um, two pieces of advice. First one would be to uh, focus on um, basically the innovation, you know, being able to foster innovation through your approach. So like Pedro said at the beginning, avoid locking from proprietary platform, use open systems so that you can have, you know, multiple vendors coming in and innovate onto, uh, onto the platform. This is true for, you know, the gateways today, obviously, or the set-top boxes, but you see this everywhere. You see this with the cloud, you know, how the clouds are going everywhere and how applications are basically ported onto this, right? So I think there's a, definitely a theme here when it comes to, um, to innovation. And then the second one is the quality, right? We said it at the beginning. I want to probably finish on quality as well. Quality of experience drives basically customers uh, in or away from your platforms, right? So always focus on quality. Make sure you always think about the quality of experience. How is your system going to um, deliver basically the content people love? How are you going to uh, interact with your end users through this good quality of experience? Thank you, Xavier. And uh, Dominic, last but not least, share your secret sauce. <laughs> it's quite simple. Uh, I'm proud to say that we we are TV experts and we help TV operator. Uh, we know that in the RDK ecosystem, all these big 
uh, telcos uh, decide to have internal resources and they need to have these internal resources. So we help them, we support them to solve all the issues related to the latency, the zapping time, the integration, the security, all the complexity with all the, the ecosystem. Uh, again, uh, this is something I said previously, uh, the fact that it's open uh, and free does not mean that it's easy. And this is why we, we created Whiteplay. We created Whiteplay to help TV operator to design solutions uh, which resonate with end user experience. So it's our mission. Okay. And maybe if you wanna, you know, if you want to see how um, working with Whiteplay looks like, we put together a little demo. Um, it's available on the website. You know, if you look it up, you'd see how the integration works. You know, what demo, uh, what the solution can do. So there's, uh, you know, a little video for you too. So a great point that I would uh, like to add to the learnings. The, you, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go with partners. So having run partnerships for half of my professional life, so partner, partner, partner with the right guys. Think where you want to go. Um, define the vision. Don't let te technology is a tool to get you where the customer wants to be. So always think the customer first. Gentlemen, it was a fantastic discussion. 45 minutes passed like nothing. We could continue for another hour, I'm sure. We need to park that for next time. So thank you everyone at home watching this panel. We hope that you learned something. That there are some key takeaways you can use in your journey to all IP. Thanks again for being with us. See you soon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.